Space, the final frontier. These are the voyages of the Starship Enterprise. Its mission, to explore strange new worlds, to discover new life and new civilizations, to boldly go where no man has gone before. When Star Trek first appeared on television in 1966, there was no such thing as a personal computer. The viewer could get no closer to Gene Roddenberry's world than his or her imagination. Now, however, computer technology allows anyone who owns a computer to not just watch, but to participate in the adventures and interact with the crew of the Enterprise. Not so long ago, one person, with the aid of one or two programs and a creative flair, could design, develop, and market the next generation of computer games. In this age of faster computers, more complex programming languages, and demands by players for ever more complicated adventures, this is no longer true. The age of multimedia has arrived, and with it, the need for larger budgets, longer development times, and a team of talented individuals in a variety of crafts. Just what does it take to create a game the size and complexity of Interplay's Star Trek judgment rights. Consumers of uh, today's computer products, especially entertainment products, have come to expect a great deal from them. Uh, computer games now have fully rendered graphics, and they have the highest quality possible sound. And also, the gamer is expecting a very plausible storyline. So with all of that in mind, uh, we spared no expense to guarantee that not just the gamer, but the Star Trek fan, who's also a gamer, would have a very satisfying experience from playing this game. Let's put the pieces together and see how Judgment Rights was made. It starts, of course, with an idea. Brian Fargo, founder and president of Interplay Productions. What we want to do is create a game that was a simulation of the original Star Trek series as opposed to a stim simulation of Star Trek. And so in doing so, we wanted to do something that was very episodic in format so that people could uh, sit down each night and, and solve uh, an episode and up to its final resolution by using their, their brains and their skills uh, and do it over a series of eight different episodes that are all linked together with a common theme. We felt that this was the closest you could get to simulating the original series rather than doing one big adventure that would take, say, 40 or 50 hours to complete. The plot of Judgment Rights is one familiar to science fiction fans. An alien race, the Brassicans, are conducting a test. The subjects of the test are the crew of the Enterprise and the crew of a Klingon warship. How they conduct themselves during the test will determine the fate of both civilizations for centuries to come. Failure could mean isolation, or worse. Uh, Rusty Butchert was the producer for the original floppy disk based version of Star Trek Judgment Rights. And he produced a very wonderful game where the story is based on the Klingons and the Federation and how they're being evaluated by this, this race who call themselves the Brassicans. All eight episodes that we present in Star Trek Judgment Rights are set against this backdrop. And in several episodes, there are confrontations with the Klingons, or with Trelane, or with some other characters. And the Brassicans are testing the metal of Kirk and his crew. And at the same time, they're testing the abilities of the Klingons to handle those situations. When finally, at the end, the crew of the Klingons and the crew of the Enterprise are brought together, where they face the Brassicans and face a, uh, a mental challenge which the player now has to think in terms of, if I was Kirk in this situation, what would be the best thing for me to do? Crafting the overall plot line and the individual stories falls to the scripters. Marco Green, author of the Judgment Rights Scenario, Museum Piece. Designing a computer adventure game is a rather imposing task. It's not just that you're writing and designing a single story at one time. A scenario is essentially several stories going on at the same time. Uh, it's kind of a good way to visualize it. Imagine a tree 
and the story starts at the base of the tree and every time you work up and a player makes an action or a decision, the story and scenario branch out. And some of these branches can have radical uh, changes to the entire story. Uh, some will lead to some sort of failure. You can put yourself in a position that not even James T. Kirk can get you back out. When you design a game like this, you don't want just one answer. There's, there shouldn't be any one single right path. Um, this essentially wouldn't be much different than watching TV or a movie than you know where the story starts and ends. This one, we want to create something where you can have several different endings, uh, again, very different endings to your entire story. This creates a lot of uh, complexity to the work because um, you're not only working off this, these story branches, but at the same time you have to take into account things like uh, the computer interface, how the player is actually going to uh, be able to look at an item, what he sees when he looks at the item, can he pick something up, can he manipulate it. All these sort of computer functions also take uh, make an effect on your story and what you're trying to tell and how you tell it. All of that, all that is just for one story, one scenario. Now in Judgment Rights we had eight scenarios and to top on all these other little complexities, all eight scenarios had to have a connecting thread. So that meant that even if one scenario had maybe four different endings, each one of those endings had to logically progress this overriding story thing. So again, it's just one more thing to throw in this entire mix, which meant that all the writers, uh, Liz Danforth, Mike Stackpole, Scott Benny and I, we all had to do uh, quite a bit of communication on this project. Once the plot line and episodes have been decided on, the next critical element is the visual one. Graphic art, the backgrounds, characters and objects, is a crucial aspect to any multimedia project. It is a time-consuming process which requires excruciating detail to provide a rich visual atmosphere. So, how do we get this from this? Todd Camasta, head of Interplay's art department, explains. Star Trek Judgment Rights was a sequel from the original 25th anniversary. So we had already established a look and a style. Um, it has also made our job easier is the fact that it is an established look from the 70s. The series is 70s high, high tech. So we already had a, st a style. We had personalities already established by famous actors. Um, our job was to take that interface from the first game and to put it into the sequel. Sometimes there are some people on a project that are just better animators or better background people. And what we do, what we try to do, is to use those strengths to make an animation better or make the process run smoother, faster, whatever. Um, on one part of this project, I was basically a fill artist, where a person I was teamed up with was a much better animator, and he would go ahead and do the line art, and I will take his line art and color it in. And to me, that, that's fine. That's part of the art process. I don't mind doing things like that. It might seem like grunt work to somebody else, but it's part of what we do as artists, and you just do it. The sequel for Judgment Rights, uh, we put more humor into it. We knew that there would be voices. Um, it, it made it a little bit easier, uh, a little more fun, and uh, I think that was the key to managing 11 people, is to make it fun. And they all had the same goal. Uh, when you're doing a sequel, it is a lot more easier to uh, have a goal, have a finishing line, have the light at the end of the tunnel. So it made it a little more easier for me on the second run uh, managing this many people. Once the team has created the visual elements of the game, it's time to add voices to the characters. Here, I'm taping voiceover dialogue from the Judgment Rights script. Unlike a movie or television plot where there's only one outcome, a linear plot line, if you will, in this interactive adventure, I frequently have to read two, three, or sometimes even four alternate texts for the same situation. As the player makes decisions that affect the direction a game scenario will take, the appropriate response will be played. Recording and then preparing the over 13,000 separate lines of dialogue is the task of Charles Deenan 
and his staff of sound engineers. Star Trek Judgment Rights, the largest voice editing project Interplay Audio Department has ever taken on, includes over 240 hours of recorded material, seven binders of scripts, over three months of work, and it all ends up on one single CD-ROM. Beginning with the raw tapes, which was recorded at some of Hollywood's finest studios, we then transferred the audio into our computers and began working on the balance and tone of the sound in each character. Once everything is transferred into our computers, we use, our, we use them to manipulate and create a, a tone and balance so that when it comes out on your speakers, it's the best possible sound and you feel like you're in the game. Recording the 13,000 lines in Judgment Rights required 28 actors in addition to the familiar cast from Star Trek. The actors were recorded at different times and in a variety of studios. To ensure that the dialogue would fit together seamlessly and flow naturally, Interplay hired professional voiceover director and performer Michael McConaughey of The Voice Works to coordinate and direct the effort. The experience of directing these people was uh, pretty phenomenal for me uh, because as everyone else in the project, uh, I saw these people as heroes from the time I was a lot younger than I am now. And the opportunity to work with them, to be accepted as an equal with them in this thing was just an astounding experience. The, uh, the idea of directing someone uh, like Leonard Nimoy or William Shatner who are quite capable directors in their own right was, was a little daunting, but they were exceptionally forgiving and very accepting. And uh, there was not a clinker in this cast of the, of the original cast of Star Trekkers. They were all, uh, without exception, giving and quick. I mean, at this point, obviously, they know what they're doing, but as far as the, uh, the supporting actors we cast, the 28 people who had, uh, uh, really a rough job because in many cases there were tripling roles which uh, everyone says well you know a good actor can do it but it's a lot different to do it as in this case working in a vacuum almost it was the actor in the booth and the director out front and there's no one in there to react with and sometimes we're able to set up the circumstances for the actor and sometimes not and these people did not have 25 years of experience to pull back on. They, uh, but they snapped in very quickly and in some instances uh, in the space of 15 minutes they'd be uh, a, a human security guard or a talking broccoli depending on the scenario. And uh, it was an awful lot of fun both to work with them and for them to work in this because it was uh, cutting edge technology and it was Star Trek. We now have three of the critical elements in the making of Judgment Rights. There's still one overriding job to be finished, however. The pieces have to be assembled into a game, something with which the player can interact and control. That's the task of an unusual group of latter-day wizards. By the time all the parts get to the programmer, the programmer's been involved in the original design. He's helped to give the artists and the musicians and the game designers and the writers limits on what you can technically do. Then it's the programmer's job to somehow exceed those limits because the artists and the musicians and everybody else will naturally want 110% of what you told them they could have. So now it's our job to somehow put it all together, come up with that 110% and still make it a great game where you're playing it and you forget that you're playing a game. We've looked at the parts. Now let's see what one short scene looks like when all the pieces are put together. Captain, the computer is locked into an infinite loop. It will continue playing the game until it defeats itself. I can interrupt the moves and input my own. Try Rook to Queen's level three. That will threaten its bishop. We are maintaining a stable position with its game. We may attain a stalemate if we want that. I don't want to lose. Let's support our queen with a pawn. That was not a very good move, Captain. Quite poor. I would not enter any chess tournaments if I were you, Captain. Spock, you wound me. Now watch me take his rook with my knight on queen's level one. Mate in three moves, Jim. Actually, four moves, Doctor. 
but it has become irrelevant. It has resigned. The brief scene from Star Trek Judgment Rights you just witnessed took 12 people and several days to complete. When you add up all the scenes, the actors, sound and video engineers, artists and programmers needed to put them all together, you begin to realize why a modern multimedia title takes months of effort and is such a monumental task. Uh, there's literally thousands of details, and when it all comes together, it's very, very gratifying. But I suppose the um, most awesome responsibility we have is having inherited the vision of Gene Roddenberry from his original show. There are some great expectations for us. And when we meet those expectations and have a great game that people can enjoy, that is the biggest thrill of all. And I hope that people who play the game have experienced the same kind of thrill that uh, the people myself and the rest of the staff experienced while we were putting the game together. In this brief time together, we've examined how the various elements of judgment rights from concept to finished game were pulled together by the combined efforts of dozens of gifted individuals. We hope you'll enjoy this, the second of Interplay's computer sojourns with the crew of the Enterprise. Already, more Star Trek games are in production. As you help guide Captain Kirk, Mr. Spock, and the rest of the crew past the tough spots in Star Trek Judgment Rights, be gentle. We'll need them all on the planet Vulcan for the next adventure.